Good evening, everybody. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School for tonight's forum, China Rising. Uh, please, if you're following this on Twitter or you want to contribute something on Twitter, use the hashtag China Rising. Uh, that way we can keep track of all the comments and tweets and, and unique insights that you all have. Tonight's forum is being moderated by IOP fellow Keith Richburg. Uh, Keith recently retired after a long, illustrative, illustrious career, career with the Washington Post. Uh, his final assignment, where he spent the last four years, was in China as a correspondent. Uh, so we're excited to have Keith with us tonight as the moderator. He'll introduce the rest of our panel. So please join me in welcoming Keith Richburg. Thank you. And it's my distinguished uh, pleasure tonight to introduce our very two very special guests. Uh, uh, first to my left, um, I think pretty much needs no introduction. Uh, John Huntsman Jr. was the U.S. Ambassador to China from 2009 until 2011. Uh, before that, he was the 16th Governor of Utah. Uh, first elected in 2004, then re-elected by close to 80% of the vote again in 2008. And before that, he had served as Ambassador to Singapore from 1992 until 1993. He began his public service career in the Reagan White House as a staff assistant, and later was uh, in the Bush White House, that's George H.W. Bush, as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce, and also a Deputy U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, and a, I, I am told, a failed rock musician. <laughs> Pretty true. <laughs> And then uh, on the far side, the Honorable Kevin Rudd was Australia's 26th Maybe. Prime Minister between 2007 and 2010. And he was the Prime Minister during the global economic crisis and helped steer Australia through that. And he, after that, he was Foreign Minister from 2010 until 2012. Uh, he was elected Labour Party leader in 2006 and became only the third Labour Party leader in Australia to win government from opposition since World War II. Uh, he remains involved, uh, very actively involved in China issues on the, uh, uh, on the global stage. And, uh, I sh and I should say also that he's a graduate of the Australian National University, uh, where he specialized in Chinese language and Chinese history. So we're very, very honored to have these two distinguished guests. Uh, I'm going to start out the conversation now to talk a little bit about, you know, the, well, really the topic is China rising, and just kind of pose it out as a question here, you know, in, in, historically, we have not seen a situation of a rising power uh, that's been able to take the world stage and, a, and a, an existing power that's seeded uh, that position without conflict. And a lot of people are wondering whether the rise of China, uh, which inevitably will overtake the US as the world's largest economy sometime in the next decade, means that there's going to be some kind of inevitable conflict. And certainly the Chinese see the American pivot to Asia in purely military terms. They see that as a U.S. attempt to kind of constrain China. I'd like to ask both of you, starting with you, Governor Huntsman, uh, is this relationship destined for some kind of a conflict, or can we have a cooperative relationship? Well, first of all, let me tell you what an honor and privilege it is to be here uh, on this terrific campus. And I just hope that if you learn nothing else from at least my end of this evening, you'll learn a lot from the Prime Minister. He is the older of the two of us. Therefore, <laughs> I can call him, a, in Chinese, they'd refer to him as a Lao Yo Tiao, the old grease stick. Mm. <laughs> so all hard questions, Keith, will go yes, to the Prime you. Minister. Uh, but I, I want all of you to reflect on where you are. This is an unbelievable institution. And it's a great honor to be here. And I hope you package up what you learn here and go out and change the world. That's, that's my only admonition to you. Uh, so the US-China relationship is now into 40 plus years. Uh, it's never been smooth sailing. Uh, we have to recognize it for what it is. The uh, world order is, is changing. Uh, China is a rising power. It is seen uh, through the prism of fear uh, by a lot of Americans as opposed to an opportunity factor. Uh, the future will really be determined by how America and Americans respond to the shifting world order. And that has a lot to do with our leaders and how they present the case for a changing world. Because without a proper articulation or explanation of why things are happening and why we, not, we might not be falling as far behind as some might wish to articulate, at least in political terms, that's gonna, that's gonna take A, some political leadership, and B, 
Uh, I think the localizing and humanizing of the U.S.-China relationship where mayors and governors, educators take more of a stepped up role in interacting with what is the most important relationship of the 21st century. But it's competitive and in certain ways it's cooperative. And the one thing that I've come to find is we are pretty much married and divorce isn't an option. You just have to make the damn thing work. And that's the tough part. Because in politics, I found during the recent presidential election, it's a lot easier to stand on a debate stage and talk about what you're going to do to China as compared to what you're going to do with China. It's easy to throw out a gratuitous soundbite and get an applause line. And we heard too much of that during the last election cycle. The hard part is to define the reality of where we are in history and the pathway going forward that is going to maintain prosperity and security in the world. That isn't a given. That's going to take work on both sides, particularly with the emerging generation. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Rudd, you, to that same question, and you just wrote a very, very insightful article in Foreign Affairs magazine that touched on this very question as to whether there has to be conflict in the future. How would you address that? Well, as leading senior citizen here this evening, uh, <laughs> given the introduction That's earlier on, uh, let me give you the benefit of decades of experience and insight, if not centuries. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, by the way, for all the Australians here in the uh, Harvard audience, uh, it's good to have you here this evening. There'll be free beers afterwards if you laugh a lot at my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, this is, and it's great to be here with, uh, with John because uh, when he was ambassador in China, I was foreign minister and we would talk from time to time in Beijing about I, what I regard to be uh, the central question for the first half of the 21st century, which is can we collectively, and our collective wisdom, manage the rise of China uh, without seeing conflict uh, with the United States, preserving the peace and building a common prosperity. Uh, I believe we can. Firstly, what's the emerging reality? Um, if uh, China emerges as the world's largest economy by whichever measure over the next decade, which I regard as probable, uh, then the historical significance of this cannot be underestimated. It'll be the first time since George III was on the throne that you will have a non-Western, non-English speaking, non-democracy as the world's largest economy. Uh, this is not a small thing, it is quite a large thing. <clears throat> because uh, where power goes, be it economic or strategic, then frankly, influence uh, works its way through the global system. And therefore, the real question for us all is, if this occurs, what will be the rules of the global and regional order as China becomes more central to the global power equation? That's uh, the challenge. Secondly, uh, I believe that it is certainly possible to do this cooperatively. Uh, for this to occur, however, will require us collectively, both China, the United States, uh, the West and the rest, to somewhat begin to rewire our own strategic mindsets. At present, the dialing of our strategic mindsets is pretty decisively in a negative uh, trajectory, a negative direction. If you look closely at the official literature emerging from uh, the political class in, uh, in both capitals, <clears throat> um, there are reasons for that. There are real differences of strategic perspective and there are differences of strategic interest. But my view is this, if you look at the commonality of interests uh, between China and the United States, you look at, as uh, John just said before, the overwhelming engagement which is occurring at subnational levels uh, between our countries and Chinese provinces and Chinese cities, economically, socially, the number of Chinese students studying in our world universities, American universities, we have at any one time 120,000 Chinese students in Australia are studying. Uh, this is unfolding at the same time. Therefore, the new mindset, which I believe is necessary, is how do we actually consciously build strategic trust between China and the United States through a program of regular summitry between the two countries' leaders, which is task-oriented, which is focused on areas of real potential cooperation, and through that, step by step, build the basis for long-term strategic trust.
I think that's possible. I think it's doable. It will require leadership in both capitals. I'd like to pick up on that point. What are some of those specific areas, those strategic areas, where the U.S. and China could be working together now? And I'd start with you, Ambassador Huntsman. For example, we see a lot of belligerent rhetoric now coming out of North Korea. China has a lot of influence there as their major partner. Is that an area where we could work together, or is China not really going to play ball on that? Well, I think we have to recognize the, the most profound change in the U.S.-China relationship over the last 40 years is the fact that we've become a global relationship in a sense. It's the only one that we have in the world, and it's the only one that China has. And how you then recalibrate your dialogues and your diplomatic uh, interaction to accommodate the fact that there isn't a whole lot that plays out in this world, whether it's dead in Europe or the island issues in the East China Sea or the South China Sea, or uh, health issues in Sub-Saharan Africa that don't somehow play through the U.S.-China relationship. The challenge today really is how, how you, A, recognize that it's a global relationship and begin to redefine our messaging and our agenda based upon the nature of today's relationship. Kevin is absolutely right that our, our modes of interaction are dated and I think highly ineffective. For example, the strategic economic dialogue, which seeks to corral a lot of our bilateral issues. It's uh, a couple of days of a cast of thousands that is well scripted. Everyone who has a working group between the United States and China. The challenge for me as ambassador was, how do you manage 100 different working groups? Everybody wants to have a work. In the US government, if you don't have a working group with China, you're, uh, uh, you lack credibility. You're not a player. So everybody wants to have their own working group, which means you have to have a place at the strategic and economic dialogue, which means two days uh, are wasted on people focused on their three minutes of talking points as opposed to the really big issues that need to be handled at the head of state level. So reorienting this relationship to one that is less top heavy, more nimble, more focused on the regular interaction of the heads of state, because that's the only level at which it can be driven a relationship where the interaction is pure and sincere and in some cases spontaneous, trust is built, friendships are uh, developed and maintained, and it isn't on the margins of you know, global confabs, the UNGA or the G20 uh, or APEC. And then you really have to start drilling down on the more immediate issues between us, and the world would expect that uh, the most prominent issues would be nuclearization in Iran, uh, North Korea, uh, economic issues, uh, uh, the South China Sea. But I think beyond those issues that typically make the top three or four billings on the agenda, we're missing some huge opportunities in areas of science, for example. The scientific collaboration, uh, environmental collaboration, basic research, where both countries have some of the finest research uh, infrastructure, some of the best minds, yet we haven't figured out a way of really corralling this power and doing something with it for the well-being of the world. Are we missing an opportunity? We are missing a huge opportunity. So when I look at what this relationship could be, mm -hmm. yeah, the range of security and economic issues need to be part of our interaction, mm -hmm. but we're not thinking big enough. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not even scratching the surface in terms of what the relationship is capable of, in terms of what it could yield for the well-being of the world. And, and just to clarify, the President of the U.S., the President of China meet regularly, but it's always on the sidelines of another summit of a, uh, a, G, a G20. It's, it's on the sidelines, and it, you, you, know, you get through you know, the, inter the translation, the interpretation, uh, and both sides have to get through you know, their core points, and that takes up probably 75% of the time together, and you've got a few moments left to actually talk about things beyond your core issues. No real time to build uh, uh, a relationship, uh, and you're always kind of rushed because it's on the sidelines of something else. This has to be a regularized, focused, uh, dedicated level of interaction at the highest levels of our government. It's the only way you can get things done in China. And Prime Minister, I think you're in agreement with that, correct? That there should be this sustained high-level engagement between the two superpowers? Very much so. I mean, it's uh, too important to leave simply to casual encounters on the sides of other things. The truth is in the Chinese political system, the leader matters 
matters big time. If you want big decisions taken, then frankly, it's the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, the President of the country, who makes those decisions. It's his final call. Therefore, regular summitry, by which I mean um, the two leaders spending serious time with each other, uh, initially with a relatively open agenda in order to build a level of personal trust and then becoming more uh, focused on a working agenda of issues on the current global agenda, whether it's um, the WTO, whether it's climate change, whether it's nuclear non-proliferation, the regional agenda, Korea we've um, been talking about, um, or other regional confidence and security building measures, bilaterally, uh, the big one, cyber security, um, the expansion of free trade in Asia and the Pacific, for example, through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But the chemistry for this to happen has to be through summits. Um, these are not uh, the ancient tools of diplomacy no longer relevant in the current um, age of uh, rapid and immediate um, digital communication. Uh, it just ain't like that. These two folks have to get to each other, which is why a uh, speech I gave yesterday in uh, Washington at the Carnegie Endowment, I said, look, why don't we set this ball going, set this ball rolling by uh, the uh, President Obama and President Xi Jinping getting together for a working weekend at Camp David in a few months' time, well prior to uh, the St. Petersburg G8 G20 meeting, where they're going to meet uh, on the margins. I think that would be useful, and I think it would be a good step forward. And, and if I can press you, Prime Minister, on that just a little further, what are some of the areas that the US and the China could start cooperating on to build trust before getting to those larger strategic areas? Are there some mutual talking points that can go around? Well, frankly, I think um, my overall uh, argument in terms of building strategic trust uh, is this, that you cannot decree that strategic trust will exist uh, between China and the United States starting at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, Beijing time. Uh, it doesn't work like that. This is a product, as it is within our personal relationships, of step by step, um, establishing trust on doing one thing together, together, then the next, then the next. Um, therefore, um, let's take, uh, frankly, a big one rather than a small one, but possibly a bite-sized one at the same time. One of the core debates is whether China in the future, if it becomes um, the world's dominant economy and increasingly um, has um, global military reach, uh, will China in the future continue to adhere by the global rules-based order, which we've had characterizing or underpinning the international system since 1945? Big question. You ask the Chinese this in Beijing and they speak to their think tanks, they will say, we don't like the rules of the current rules-based order, but we don't have an alternative order to recommend. Um, now, the key question, as I would see it, is how do you get China and the United States now cooperating directly on those elements of the current rules-based order which aren't working. We've had stalled uh, global trade round negotiations now for nearly a decade, the Doha round. This is necessary to conclude, frankly, to give a, an added momentum to global economic growth at present. Uh, we have rapid Chinese action now on climate change with the uh, impending emergence of either a carbon tax or a cap and trade system in China to deal with climate change. It's radically changed since three years ago. Can we take that forward between China and the United States? Or thirdly, pro more problematically, with greater difficulty, the nuclear non-proliferation agenda given the reality of Korea, North Korea and the reality of Iran. We shouldn't shy away from these, but what's the overall principle? China and the US making the current order work in a way in which parts of it are not working at present. I know there are differences, I know there are difficulties. But I think if there is goodwill between the two of them, you can make progress. In, in, let's go ahead. Let, let me just build on that for a moment. Two things will be critical mm -hmm. to making the progress that I think is possible between the United States and China. One is we need to get back to thinking bigger and more aspirational in terms of the ultimate goal. I mean, what is the promised land? Where is it that we want to take the relationship? There is no grand design today. There's no strategy. So consequently, we're spinning wheels. We've always done better as a relationship when we've been in pursuit of something aspirational that conjoins our, our shared interests, whether it was Cold War politics and fear of uh, the Soviet Union 
or in the 90s more immediately, WTO accession for China. That kept us busily engaged in something that they wanted and something that we thought was good as well. We're missing that aspirational piece. And whether that's a major trade initiative or a scientific undertaking or an environmental undertaking, that has to be thought through and put in place. That, that captures both sides. Without that, you fall victim to the headlines, which are never positive. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a tit for tat. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way the relationship is running today. The second part is that, you know, as an optimist, I see some blue sky out there in the sense that the, the cycles of the bilateral relationship have been harmonized. Now, let me tell you what I mean about that. China's been through the 18th Party Congress as of last November. They've just had the People's Congress through March. Xi Jinping has consolidated his power. We have a reelected president, which means every moment counts. There's no reason for the president of the United States to be kicking the can down the road until late fall before he first has a meeting with Xi Jinping. So I would argue we have two to three good years ahead where the externalities that typically disrupt the relationship will be at a minimum. No elections, yeah, politics will be sort of a low, low roar. And we have an opportunity to really put in place uh, a kind of visionary relationship and one that creates a different kind of structure for interaction. But that has to be done soon. And I fear if we don't take advantage of the opening that we are now just beginning, we're gonna lose uh, much needed momentum mm -hmm. and we're gonna fall victim to the next election cycle, which again will take uh, a lot of the energy out of the relationship. But we've announced this pivot to China, uh, to Asia, and we've said that China is the most important relationship. The, the, new, the new Secretary of State, John Kerry, hasn't gone to Asia yet. He's gone to the Europe, he's gone to the Middle East, he's going back to the Middle East. Shouldn't he be going to China? Well, the Secretary is uh, headed to China in two weeks' time, as I understand right. it. And it'll be an important visit. Um, and I know, having just come from Beijing, that our Chinese friends are uh, looking forward to that visit with anticipation and a certain degree of intrepidation as well in terms of how it will all turn out. Uh, so I don't think there's an argument to be advanced that uh, Secretary Kerry is going to disregard China. Uh, the United States is a global superpower. It walks and chews gum. There is a thing called the Middle East and it's not a happy place a lot of the time. Um, as, a, <laughs> as a China guy, I kind of get that. Um, and Europe still exists. Um, so, um, uh, and so uh, uh, I don't think that's where the criticism lies. Um, the, the real opportunity, and this is where John is absolutely right, we do have a unique window of opportunity here. President Obama is not needing to seek a re-elect. Um, this is a, a unique period of time. This is a one in 10 year event we now have with the People's Republic of China where we have a newly established Chinese administration under Xi Jinping. And the other point I'd make about Xi Jinping having spent a large part of my life analyzing Chinese domestic politics. Um, I used to be a foreign service officer back in the um, Neolithic period of my career. The, um, <laughs> the uh, not Mesolithic. Uh, <laughs> though you would say Paleolithic, given your earlier remarks, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, is that Xi Jinping, I believe, is different in the sense that the United States, I believe, can work with this individual. He has a degree of self-confidence as a leader, an ability to, frankly, work without scripted notes, and a, a sense, I believe, of an historian about the responsibility now resting on his shoulders as well to preserve the peace and to carve out a new defining relationship with the United States. I may pr be proven to be wrong, but as I see this juncture in history, and we are ultimately not simply passive victims of some determinist forces in history, inevitably leading us in the direction of some conflict, we make active choices to shape our future. I think there's enough there on the table at the moment, uh, in terms of possibilities, for these two leaders to meet in what history has given us as a Pretty unique historical right. window. Mm -hmm. We're going to open it up soon for questions, so get ready. But I'll ask one more, both of you. I'm wondering if, if you think the Chinese would be receptive to that kind of a relationship. You know the Chinese leaders. You've met with them you know, in a deeper level than any of us can. What would be their response if they get that kind of an overture from the US to have these kind of high-level sustained summit meetings to say, we really want to engage you strategically? Would they, would they see that with suspicion, or would they jump at that chance? 
We've had examples of that in the past where things actually have worked at a, at a more strategic level uh, earlier in the relationship. Uh, and when there's dysfunctionality in the way in which we interact, I think we're taken advantage of. And I think China is just fine taking advantage of us and the dysfunction on our side in terms of our modalities for interaction, uh, which is not good for us. We're, we're diminished and disadvantaged at the negotiating table because we don't have our act together as a result. Uh, I, I do think for purposes of a longer term, broader vision economically, uh, and for greater certainty on the security side, they would welcome that kind of dialogue. I know they would welcome that kind of dialogue, but it would have to be structured properly. And it would have to be a dialogue that uh, moreover was based on trust and confidentiality. Uh, things leak into newspapers after our high level meetings. And WikiLeaks. That, <laughs> I'll say. Uh, and that just means that the next go around, we're gonna suffer the implications of that. Uh, at a time when we need uh, the tank full of trust, which is the fuel that really drives the relationship. And uh, we're in some need of, of, of replenishing the, uh, the fuel tank. Minister Rudd, would they be suspicious of these kind of overtures or would they jump at the chance to? Look, here's my wild punt as a gambling Australian. The, um, we don't gamble really in Australia. The, um, uh, and it's I'll this. I'll take you to Utah if you don't gamble. <laughs> I could say something there, but I won't. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, um, the, um, uh, it's, it's this. Uh, if uh, the President uh, of the United States was to come up with a sort of proposal for um, an early and formal summit, and frankly, Camp David's been used for these purposes many times in the past, mm -hmm. and, uh, though Chinese leaders have not been to Ch Camp David, in my recollection anyway, um, and they're good for working level type conferences and intimate, which is, uh, I think, what you want at this stage. I think such a proposal would freak out the Chinese bureaucratic establishment completely and probably be welcomed by senior leaders um, if I was to make a call on it. And the secondly, there's a reason for that. And the reason is that senior leaders in China actually are very realistic about the challenges they now themselves face as the people who will carry the responsibility into history for dealing with the current set of challenges they face. They need strategic ballast in the relationship with the United States right now because what, for example, if things get out of control on the Korean Peninsula? This is not a remote possibility. It is a real possibility that if there is a conventional provocation across the parallel from North Korea, uh, given the political position which President Park now finds herself in in South Korea, uh, you are looking at a high probability of a conventional response. You're therefore looking at the possibility of escalation. You're therefore looking at what then happens on the telephone between the President of the United States and the President of the People's Republic of China. You need strategic ballast of trust to draw upon for those sorts of circumstances, as well as dialing down the current level of uh, strategic tensions which currently characterize the East China Sea with Japan and the South China Sea with Southeast Asia. So I think the Chinese have interest in this occurring as well. But as I said, I think there'll be people in the foreign ministry in Beijing who are biting their fingernails off uh, at the thought of the possibility. <laughs> I want to bring the unscripted. <laughs> I want to bring the audience in here. And, and as usual, there are four microphones stationed around. Um, I just ask that you follow the normal rules, which you all know if you've been to our forums before. Uh, please uh, identify yourself and your affiliation. That doesn't necessarily mean your political party affiliation. One brief question and no speeches, and please remember that questions do end in a question mark. <laughs> so we'll start over here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sita Gofard. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and first of all, it's a great honor to hear from all of you, so thank you very much. I wanted to ask you specifically about um, cooperation with China in a very uh, specific field, which is climate change. Um, and I know, Mr. Rudd, this is an issue that Australia cares very deeply about. Um, China and the U.S. are the two largest emitters of carbon dioxide, and it is obviously very clear that um, any feasible and uh, workable um, and serious attempt to tackle climate change requires buy-in from both the U.S. and China, um, which we haven't really seen um, shown in, in a very sort of, in a very committed way. Um, so I was just, I would like to hear your thoughts on this specific topic. Do you think it's 
um, possible for the U.S. and China to collaborate closely on some sort of climate, uh, climate change agreement um, by, for example, 2020 when the Kyoto Protocol will expire? Um, and what are the challenges going forward with that? Thank you. Well, um, two quick points. Um, the Chinese have traveled light years on this question since the Copenhagen uh, summit uh, of so-called COP16 um, in, at the end of 2009. I attended that. I saw the, the problems which unfolded uh, up close and personal. Um, secondly, th less than three and a bit years later, you have the Chinese now on the verge of a decision about whether they're going to have a carbon tax or a cap and trade system domestically. Um, this is a lot of distance travel in a relatively short period of time. Why have the Chinese done that? Thirdly, because they believe that China's future rise and return to great power status in the region of the world could be fundamentally undermined by uh, radical impacts of climate change within China itself. So as the world's largest emitters, they've got to act which goes to the responsibility of the United States. Um, it would be ironic if in 12 months' time we have a law passed through the National People's Congress in Beijing um, which imposes one, one or other of those measures. Um, Europe has acted, China would have acted. Uh, Prime Minister Gillard in Australia has brought about a price uh, on carbon through the Australian Parliament. Uh, then the United States and India would be the odd people out. Uh, I think this would bring enormous international pressure to bear in the United States. So the US, I say this advisedly as I'm a visitor to a friendly country, really needs to get its act together on this question. Um, you pump out a lot of stuff. Uh, you're the second largest polluter in the world uh, and frankly the impact is being felt across your continent as well. Anything to add? Gee, as a Republican talking about climate change, I feel I might get struck by lightning or something. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me say that any... It increases, any <laughs> it increases extreme weather events, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say man-made climate change. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the agenda for China, I believe, will be driven by a couple of things on, on climate change. One will be the very real need to address the immediate pollution problems. China would like to see their cities, Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, uh, become world-class cities. You can't become world-class destinations and draw in brain power and capital when the cities are uninhabitable. So I think, that, I think the, the real need to change and pragmatics will drive China more than anything else. So that, that, will, be, that will be one. Number two will be the economics of, of climate change. Third, if I could just throw this in, will probably be a response to overtures made by the United States, and there haven't been a whole lot. And I'm not sure there will be much coming out of the United States until unemployment gets down to, you name the number. You know, for whatever reason, uh, this is where we find ourselves. Even under a democratic administration, it, it isn't much of a priority. But when we do get together and talk, and I've been in some of those meetings, we are a bit hobbled by uh, different readings of science. So we, we read different texts, we draw different conclusions. What we fundamentally need, and I try to do this a bit as, as ambassador through uh, uh, a couple of our scientific outfits, was to begin to harmonize the benchmarking, how we read science. So when we have our meetings, we don't waste the whole day uh, quibbling over uh, data, uh, but rather have a harmonized set of numbers that we can begin to then consider policies on top of. We're not anywhere near that, so my sense is that third component is kind of the imponderable, and that is what will be the, uh, the response of the United States, and to what extent will they move China along? Now, I used to make the argument that, you know, as governor of a western state, you know, a certain percentage of their emissions would land on our doorstep, and so it really is a global issue, and we're all downstream, and we have to see it as such. It is a global issue, and it requires a global solution and it's going to require some responsible stakeholders in order to get it done. Mm -hmm. Just to underscore your first point, every, every day I get an email from hearing about people leaving China because of the expats leaving Beijing because of the air pollution there, it or was, companies that cannot find recruits who want to go there. It was very telling to read a tweet recently. So on top of the embassy, we used to have an air quality monitor, and we'd tweet out, you know, 
uh, our data, and it would, I'd get called in occasionally, you know, by the foreign ministry, very upset about, you know, the information we put out and saying how it was wrong, you know. Well, you're closer to the ring road, and therefore your numbers are going to be far different than, than our numbers. But I was intrigued to find uh, one senior uh, government official tweet out recently, or maybe it was from their, one of their ministries, that U.S. EPA standards increasingly should be recognized. I never thought I'd live long enough to hear that. <laughs> so what's happening? Well, uh, they're exceeding by a significant amount the, the air quality standards, but they're hearing about it from their own people like never before. And I, I, I think that what moves the market in China is the outcry by the people, driven by 700 million internet users and 90 to 100 million bloggers that's a pretty significant voice out there. Mm -hmm. Question up there. Mr. Richberg, Mr. Hansman, and Mr. Rudd, thank you very much for being here. My name is Tiffany Lazo. I'm from the JFK Junior Forum, and I'm going to ask the official Twitter question. To what extent do you believe that the USA and China are already engaged in a cyber war? To what extent are the US and China already engaged in a cyber war? <laughs> Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, I'm not an American, <laughs> and I'm not Chinese. Look, uh, the reality is, um, let's use a slightly more neutral term, cyber conflict uh, is, uh, is underway. Um, and um, uh, you've seen all the commentary uh, from American firms in recent times. Um, and uh, this is, I believe, a potentially significantly disabling element of the China-US relationship, and not just the China-US relationship, uh, but the China relationship with a number of other countries around the world as well. So, the real question is, what do you do about it? I said before that uh, I think one of the uh, areas where strategic trust now must be built uh, is in this domain, and it should be on the agenda of a rolling set of summits because the sensitivities associated with this, in, with this agenda, both in terms of the interests of states and the interests of corporations and of individuals and non-government organisations are, so, are so profound that this must be a matter for leaders and their experts to consider. I don't know how you define war in the context of cyber. But I'd have to say that there's a serious skirmish going on. And where that goes uh, will really be up to both sides and how they define the rules of the road and the red lines around cyber intrusion. There is clearly an espionage side and then there's a commercial side, to put it in perspective. Uh, and to look at the billions of dollars that have been lifted from our commercial entities. So cyber intrusion, it's expected that governments are gonna engage in a certain level of poking back and forth around national security targets, right? It is not assumed that private citizens, civil society, private companies are gonna be the target of massive theft. And that's where we are today. So whereas some would recognize the red lines, uh, China, which I would consider to be probably 80% of the problem of cyber intrusions, uh, does not recognize those lines. And you know, I'm, I'm co-chairing a cyber security commission. We're gonna release some findings and perhaps even some recommended solutions in a couple of months. Uh, it's a widespread problem, well beyond that which most Americans uh, have any sense of what is the case. Uh, and finding solutions is the hard part. Because when you sit down and try to have a conversation with your Chinese counterpart on this, we get the response of either we're not responsible so it's good for China in the sense that it's asymmetric. There's plausible deniability. What's not to like about the whole cyber side? And it's, well, here are the targets that you hit yesterday. Uh, so where do we take the conversation? It's, uh, it's one where it's, it will require a combination of both the heft of uh, outside governments, probably foremost the United States, coupled with a very serious voice within China, probably representative of, the, of their emerging creative entrepreneur, entrepreneurial uh, innovative class, where they have said, this is now our problem. 
And to cite that, I'll just take you back to when I lived in Taiwan the, a second time in the 80s, where the Xinju Industrial Park was created, 1987, 88. And with it, a lot of Taiwan indigenous innovation. And Taiwan, they, they were egregious violators of our intellectual property. We forget about that part. And uh, the problem was pretty much resolved and in a very timely fashion when the local innovators in Taiwan began to make this their issue. And I think it won't be too many more years before innovators uh, and entrepreneurs in China begin to take this up as one of their issues and begin to put pressure on their own government. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be a combination of voices and we'll have to weigh in. Mm -hmm. Question up here. Thank you. My name's Josh Hicks. I'm a senior at the college. Uh, Mr. Rudd, in the wake of the Chinalco Rio deal collapse, you spoke a little bit about uh, Chinese investment and how that relates to the national interest. In your opinion, what, what would be an example of Chinese investment that isn't in the national interest uh, of Australia or the US? Uh, for <clears throat> American friends and international friends, and I may not be familiar with the details of this, it was a controversial case uh, involving um, a uh, large-scale Chinese uh, uh, foreign investment application into Australia. I think the first point to say is that um, with um, China is that it is increasingly going to be a source of uh, global investable capital. Just the numbers speak for themselves. Um, secondly, um, we in Australia, because of the concentration of the resources industry within our economy, have been in the last several years a particular destination point for Chinese uh, investment activity. Um, thirdly, in the last five years um, that we've been in office, uh, the um, uh, total number of uh, Chinese investment applications uh, have been very, very large. The approval of those runs at about the 95 to 98 percent level. Uh, the data as of last year, given to me by the National Development Reform Commission, was that Australia was the single largest quantitative destination for Chinese foreign investment in the world. That's last year. So the argument that somehow we shut the door to Chinese investment is not empirically sustained, which is part of the assumption, I think, underpinning your question. Finally, the reason we have an institution called, in Australia called the Foreign Investment Review Board, uh, which has existed for a long, long time, is that we do appraise large-scale investments against an open national interest test and we will make a judgment. Um, and that, I think, is parallel with all countries around the world. Uh, and I add one <coughs> footnote to the above. Um, if I was to put together a list of the uh, Chinese restrictions which currently pertain to inbound investment by Australian, American or other firms in a whole range of industries in China, uh, in, uh, in uh, strategically sensitive resource industries, etc or if I was to say we'd like to become a major investor, investor in the Chinese uh, telecommunication system, um, then from various quarters in China, reservations may be raised. So, frankly, uh, this is very much a two-way street as well. Thank you. Question here. Thank you for joining us here tonight. My name is Matthew. I'm an MPA student at the Kennedy School, and I also work for the U.S. government. Um, I'd like to ask a question which is related to the one that was just asked, um, specifically when Chinese state-owned enterprises invest overseas or operate overseas, to what extent should we view them as commercial enterprises and to what extent should we view them as government agencies? And to the extent that in the U.S., uh, Chinese investment in the U.S. can perhaps align our interests and broaden our relationship, how can we effectively uh, balance that against any security concerns? Well, after the massive bailouts in the United States, one wonders how our companies ought to be recognized overseas. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, inve SOE investment or Chinese investment in the United States is probably running about $6 billion uh, based on, on recent numbers. So it's just, it represents a very small percentage. I think we're going to see a whole lot more. Um, I think investment in the United States just has to be a straight up assessment of whether or not a company uh, uh, abides by rules and regulations uh, and those uh, 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 guidelines set out by, by our state and federal laws. Some will and some won't. I suspect that 
many SOEs are going to wait before they come to the United States. They're going to see how others uh, experience or have experiences in the marketplace, whether it works out for them or not. I think uh, China is very uh, hesitant to move too much here to the United States for fear of a backlash like uh, they saw toward Japan 25 years ago. So they're going to move in with caution, and I think they're going to strategically place their investments through SOEs or direct investments, and they're going to wait it out and see how it goes. And based on that experience, I think you're going to have more in the way of SOEs, who are probably 70, 80 percent of the major companies in China, uh, begin to do more. Uh, as you know, a country investment here would be a very good thing. If people are willing to abide by the rules of the road and, uh, and respect uh, our commercial practices, which are pretty much the global standard, I personally, I think that's, that's a good thing. I think in, in, in return for that, you're likely to see some of the SOEs and major Chinese entities become more transparent, uh, probably adopting governance practices that are more akin to ours. So what does China want? They want respected commercial entities. They want global reach. They want to have the same feel and texture that some of our name brand companies have. I think there's great respect on the part of China toward our major companies. Uh, they want to be more like that. Uh, and I think part of learning how to get to that standard of operation uh, is probably going to come through investing some of their wherewithal here in the market. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. My name is Steve Randazzo. I'm from New York. And this May, I'll be graduating from the Kennedy School with a master's in public policy. My question is for Ambassador Huntsman. Um, you mentioned that Americans tend to view the Chinese through, I think you said, a prism of fear. And I wanted to know why you think that is, one. And two, um, what is your sense of the prism through which the Chinese view Americans? Thanks. It's an excellent question. And I would say the first part, just sort of reflect on the last election cycle. Did we have a single constructive conversation about where to take the US-China relationship? Or did we pick apart mostly for political rhetoric and for purposes of pandering, I just have to call it what it is, uh, the parts of the relationship that were easy targets? Currency, IPR practices, human rights. So if you want an easy applause line in a town hall meeting, that's where you go. I haven't heard a lot of conversation politically about what we do with a relationship and where we go longer term, which is exactly the conversation that we need right now. So consequently, when you're a political class, and I would have to say much of the reporting coming out in the major papers is also you know, focusing more on uh, the dysfunctionality of, of China in transition, uh, then I think it's going to lead to certain impressions here. That then coupled with high unemployment, I think that all results in a natural and not unexpected fear factor. When unemployment goes down, I remember when unemployment was down is when I was a governor, not so long ago, 2005, 2006, everyone wanted to engage with China. Everybody wanted to invest and do trade missions there. I think you'd be hard pressed to find any members of Congress who will take a mission to China because there are no political benefits from doing so. So that's a complicating factor in the sense that now more than ever, we need people who understand the subject matter. We need people who actually have an understand, a nuanced understanding of politics, economics, and culture in China. And we have very little of it right now. So we're going to have to rely on, I think, the next generation, many people sitting here in this room, to be able to cut through uh, a lot of the political sound bites and the modern day narrative, which does tend to focus more on a fear factor as opposed to an opportunity factor and really begin putting in place a kind of dialogue, a kind of interaction at all levels of, uh, of, uh, of culture uh, that begins to humanize and localize the US-China relationship. So how do you change the fear factor? People in their individual communities have to see that there's some benefit in supporting the US-China relationship. And when they don't, they'll fall, they'll fall victim to the fear factor. When you see exports in your local communities, when you see jobs created in your local communities as a result of trade, as a result of exports, 
to you know, the second largest economy in the world, then you begin to see things a little differently. So did the alfalfa farmers in Utah, when the alfalfa market opened not so long ago, begin to see China in a different sense than before? They went from enemy to customer. Uh, and I think local communities will see a lot more of that because I do believe that China will become a significant export opportunity for the United States is a, is a kind of migrate from uh, an investment-led export model to more of a consumption model. They're going to be consuming a whole lot more of our goods. So I think that gives us an opening, an opportunity to begin to see China more from an opportunity standpoint. And the second part of that is how do the Chinese perceive us? The rhetoric has been pretty harsh. So in direct response to our political rhetoric, they have their own political rhetoric. And let's face it, when we have elections, that's you know, to be expected. When they have leadership changes, as we have seen, the 18th Party Congress, the National People's Congress, that kind of rhetoric is to be expected. So why, why do I think that the next year or two is so important? Because we're away from the rhetoric of uh, leadership changes and election cycles. We actually have sort of a line of sight ahead where we could put in place some building blocks that uh, actually might get us to the next, the next level in the relationship. But I, I, I'm concerned about how the younger generation sees the United States increasingly. We've had a lot of goodwill traditionally in terms of how the United States has been seen, and I think a lot of that is eroding. Mr. Richberg, uh, Mr. Huntsman, Mr. Rudd, thank you for the great talk today. My name is Eric. I'm a sophomore at Harvard College. Hi, I'd like to welcome you to campus on behalf of the Harvard Radcliffe Chinese Students Association. Um, so originally I was going to ask a question about Sinophilia, and we were kind of beaten to the punch, but um, switching to another important issue, uh, North Korea. Um, so traditionally China has been a strong ally of North Korea, uh, given some of the recent events um, what role do you think China should be taking in dealing with North Korea, and how can America uh, apply some pressure on China to, uh, to help it realize its full potential in dealing with that relationship? Thank you. Good question. Uh, Prime Minister? Yes. Yeah, I was um, recently in Seoul last week and Beijing before coming here, and I was in D.C. yesterday. So there's been a lot of discussion about the question you have just raised. I think... Um, uh, let's tr try and look at the world from uh, through Chinese eyes right now. Uh, I think that's a, a useful discipline. Uh, number one, uh, China is directly concerned about uh, what happens if the North Koreans um, do something across the parallel, uh, as they've done in recent years with either the bombardment of an island or the sinking of a South Korean warship. Uh, what will South Korea this time do in response to any such North Korean provocation? China is right to be concerned about that because uh, the prospects for escalation are significant. And also, the Chinese are intensely literate about the dynamics in South Korean politics. And they understand that newly erected, elected President Park um, has, um, uh, may have limited room for maneuver on this question. The second thing, if you're looking at this from a Chinese national perspective, uh, is the North Korean nuclear threat, and it is one, objectively in terms of what is happening with their weapons program and their ballistic missile program, and secondly, through these appalling series of declaratory statements which become, uh, frankly, like a rerun of a bad 1930s movie, um, and have nothing to do with the language of normal 21st century diplomacy by any nation state anywhere in the world today, um, is that other states in the region, and not just the ROK, um, but uh, Japan and other US allies, uh, with the United States now working very actively at ballistic missile cooperation with each other against the contingency they actually face um, a, uh, an incoming attack at some point in the future. This is not good from China's broader national security perspective because China is also looking at its wider calculus in terms of its maritime strategy across the Pacific as well as its own contingency planning longer term vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. There's a third factor weighing in the Chinese consciousness as well. And that is with friends like North Korea who needs enemies in the world of diplomacy. Uh, frankly, North Korea does enormous damage to China's global diplomatic brand. Um, and uh, if you're going to line up friends like North Korea, Bashar al-Assad, 
um, as well as you know, from time to time various people who have run Sudan in the midst of the uh, Darfur um, um, uh, actions by the government in Khartoum, uh, then China is suffering reputational damage around the world. These three factors are now known in the Chinese leadership and having just come from Beijing, there is now for the first time a big public and certainly intense private debate about uh, changes or the possibility of changes to China's North Korea policy. None of us know how that's going to be concluded, but it's on. Um, therefore, I think one of the reasons why the sort of um, summit level meetings which John and I have been talking about today have moved from the important to the urgent is to create a level of strategic trust with the United States, uh, with China, on this core question for the future of Northeast Asian and wider Asian security and therefore the economy and jobs uh, is under given scenarios and contingencies, what do the US and China then do together? Um, that is the challenge right now. One thing I've been fascinated by is reading on Weibo the public reaction now against North Korea. And for the first time, I'm thinking maybe the government has to take public opinion into account when they're making decisions, which could be kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on North Korea, Ambassador? No, I actually think it's, uh, it presents itself as an opportunity where the United States and China can seek closer collaboration. I think our interests are aligned uh, in, in a sense. China doesn't have a relationship with North Korea that many in the West think exists. In the old days, it was a different thing, you know, under Mao Zedong and Kim Il-sung, or Deng Xiaoping or Jiang Zemin. But as you get down the line, you know, I don't know how many times Kim Jong-un, 29 years old, has actually visited China, I think once with his father several years ago. But there's not a relationship there. So, you know, the party to party, military to military, revolutionary bond kind of relationship doesn't exist like it did in the old days. And North Korea is seen more as the crazy uncle who shows up on Thanksgiving. You know, <laughs> please find the exit as fast as you can. Uh, and I, 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 I sense... Year old uncle. <laughs> yeah, mm yeah. -hmm. yeah. My, my sense <laughs> is that this provides an opening if we are smart enough to kind of shape it, uh, to bring us together around some regional solutions. With respect to North Korea uh, more immediately, I, I think this is... Uh, an outgrowth of Kim Jong-un really trying to consolidate his, his power further. Um, I think it's an expression of his uh, inability to have done so at this point among the party and the military. Uh, so he's flexing his muscle. Uh, and you have to let that pass and you hope that nothing serious happens. China will try to do what China can do. Uh, and the region will be uh, on pins and needles uh, for a while. You have to live in Northeast Asia when a bomb goes off, or when a ship is sunk, or when an island is shelled, to really get a sense of how this massively dynamic region, soon to be 20% of the world's GDP, is impacted by the belligerents from the north. It freezes up trade and investment in ways that is completely counterproductive. I wonder how many times the crazy uncle analogy just got tweeted around. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. My name is Bob Wu. I'm a sophomore at the college uh, and I'm originally from Sydney, Australia. My question is about uh, working with China from within. Both of you have experience as ambassadors in China. What sort of challenges did you experience when working with the Chinese bureaucracy? And what role do you see the Foreign Service playing uh, in China's development in the future? Well, um, the ambassador is um, uh, to my right, and uh, I've worked with the Chinese in, in different capacities, although I have worked in our embassy before in Beijing. Um, I think um, the Chinese bureaucracy itself um, is severely challenged, whether it's the foreign ministry or the bureaucratic institutions. Um, momentarily reflect what it would be like viewing the world at the moment if you're sitting on the American desk and the Chinese... Um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs just off, is it the second or third ring road? Second ring road, um, second. Yeah, where the pollution monitor is also very bad. <clears throat> um, the, you have grown up in a bureaucratic system which does not reward innovation. You've grown up in a bureaucratic system which does not encourage brave, bold new ideas about how you deal with new and emerging problems. You've grown up in a system where people who may from time to time have done that have had their, their bureaucratic careers cut short or, or at, uh, at least um, retarded. 
So therefore, there is a real problem in terms of the passivity of uh, the inertia and the defensiveness of uh, the Chinese bureaucracy. Um, the reason I make those points at, at some length is to go back to the core cool point in the argument which both John and I are advancing earlier. When we are now dealing with big strategic questions and the need for some new high-level investment in strategic trust between China and the United States, you cannot rely upon the traditional Chinese bureaucracy to frankly throw those ideas up. They're not designed for it. This must be generated and done at leadership level. The second point I'd make is that it's now critical that this occur because as um, John just mentioned in terms of North Korea, look at the whole of the Asian hemisphere. There are two massively unfolding and contradictory realities. On the one hand, all the positive forces of 21st century globalization drawing the economies and countries and peoples of Asia together in a manner which they've never been brought together before. And on the other hand, we have this set of almost 19th century primitive nationalisms wanting to rip the place apart. Uh, and I'm not just talking about China and Japan, I'm talking about more broadly across um, East Asia. Therefore, the need for, shall I say, deep strategic ballast between China and the US in the complexity that I've just described before you drill down into the individual characteristics of each crisis, pseudo-crisis or emerging crisis um, is now needed more than ever. What's it like being ambassador there? Is that fun? Well, it's the most exhilarating job in the Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. And I must say, just as an advertisement, you know, when you get to rub shoulders with, you know, a couple thousand of our nation's best and brightest, you wonder what they're doing these days. Well, a lot of our nation's best and brightest are working overseas in the Foreign Service and other departments and agencies and doing things that if most Americans could watch it and understand it, it would make them very proud. Uh, and it made me very proud as ambassador to be able to, to, be able to manage and lead them. Uh, the biggest challenge in leading the US-China relationship on the ground is finding priorities that make sense and figuring out what to do with a lot of the extraneous working groups that are going nowhere and mean very little to the interests of the United States and very little return to the taxpayers who fund them. And it's trying to kind of distill down that which is truly salient and important longer term. And then coordinating that with the bureaucracy in Washington to make sure that in the national security deputies or people's process, uh, you get a good outcome on the issues that really do matter. And the rate of growth in the relationship, as I'm sure is the case with Australia, is enormous. It didn't pay 20, 30 years ago to become a China expert in the State Department. It was still sort of at the end of the Cold War, but now it pays to become a China expert in the State Department. That's where a lot of the talent is, is migrating. So I think we're prepared for the future in the sense that we've got some good, dedicated, smart professionals who are ready to move forward. The question will be at the upper levels of our government. If we're smart enough to be able to fashion an agenda that speaks to a head of state to head of state dialogue based on trust and a long-term stri stri strategic dialogue, um, and whether or not we've got a bureaucracy that is responsive to those priorities. And I'll just end with this thought, because I remember the bureaucracy, my first trip to China, I'd lived in Taiwan in the late 70s, my first trip to China was with President Reagan when I worked on his staff as the lowest level flunky uh, in the White House in the early 80s, and I was with him in 1984 when he made a visit. I remember the, the Mao jackets and the Central Planning Commission, no English, no advanced degrees from, you know, they were revolutionaries. You didn't have time to attend school back in the old days, and not much of an understanding of the United States. And I returned, you know, having been back and forth for 30 years, to interact with ministries where the level of sophistication the fluency in English, the uh, deep understanding of the United States would shock and surprise most Americans. Mm -hmm. They have brought forward uh, a, uh, a capable cadre of top level management and they have a feeder system within the party that allows them to do that. I try to look for sort of a corollary within our own bureaucracy in Congress and the executive branch and my fear is that we're not producing a level of talent to serve our needs longer term and we're therefore likely to be diminished at the negotiating table 
whether it's on security or economic related issues. And that would be a bad outcome. And I can, I can underscore that. My first trip there was 1985, and uh, the difference between then and now is astronomical. Um, I've been told uh, we've got room for two more questions with apologies to those standing. So yes, one there, and then the final one will be there. My name is Claudia Newman-Martin. I'm a master's student at the Kennedy School and also a graduate of the Australian National University. So perhaps unsurprisingly, my question is about the role that Australia can play in bridging the divide between China and the West. My question is, what would you say are the key challenges that Australia faces in building a deeper relationship with China, particularly in light of China's human rights record, and also deepening its relationship with the US? And do you think a change of government in Australia would see any shift in our approach towards either China or the US? <laughs> the, um, let me take the, um, the first one first. <coughs> um, the, um, for Australia, uh, we're, uh, what are we, the fourth largest economy in Asia, we're the twelfth largest economy in the world, we're members of the UN Security Council, we chair the sanctions committee at the moment, we're also um, uh, members of the G20. We have a lot of engagement with China globally and regionally. And every regional Asian institution except ASEAN, we're members of with China. Um, and that's been a product of uh, combined Australian diplomacy over a long period of time. And basically, for 20 or 30 years now, we in Australia have seen so much of our future lying in the Asian hemisphere, in all of its diversity, in all of its opportunity, and all of its complexity. So whoever is in government at any time, I think, gets that basic fact. With China in particular, the challenge is this. Um, we in Australia, uh, our civilizational uh, origins are primarily Western. Uh, we have a massively multicultural society of people coming from all other parts of the world. Um, but we are who we are. We believe in freedom. Uh, we believe in economic freedom, political freedom. We believe in universal human rights. That's who we are. And we should never get to a stage in our engagement with our friends in Beijing that anyone feels the need to, frankly, uh, compromise those positions. That's us, that's our identity, that's who we are. Uh, secondly, uh, what we have demonstrated as Australians is our ability to walk and chew gum. And that is um, uh, we can uh, have a fully rounded, fully developed relationship uh, with the Chinese and at the same time uh, maintain our long-standing post-41 strategic uh, alliance with the United States. Um, these are not irreconcilable propositions, as some in the public debate from time to time suggest, not just in my country, but frankly in other countries uh, in Asia as well. Finally, what's the value added we could possibly bring to bear? You know, we in Australia can be seen, if you like, as the West in the East. Uh, it actually provides us with a fairly unique perspective. Secondly, uh, because we are who we are, uh, frankly, we don't frighten anybody. Um, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> unless you want to get in, got involved in contact sport, the, um, <laughs> and then we're really frightened of the New Zealanders. No, the um, <laughs> the um, my point is that as the West uh, in the East, and given our multicultural reality, and given the fact that five percent of our own population now uh, are Chinese, we actually see these uh, challenges emerging uh, in uh, the wider Asian hemisphere through a lens which is sometimes different from that which is seen in Washington and sometimes different from that which is seen certainly in the capitals of Europe. I don't recommend that Australia can actually perform the function as some have recommended for us as some bridge between East and West. Each country will judge its own relationships. But there is a wisdom, frankly, in understanding this region, wider East Asia and China in particular, uh, as seen from the region out and not just from the rest of the world looking in. And uh, that, I think, is potentially our value added in the discussions we have with American allies, friends in Europe, and frankly, the rest of Asia as well. I'm pretty optimistic about Australia's future um, uh, in the hemisphere, which is our home. And for the final question, I don't suppose you're a New Zealander, right? Yeah. Okay, fine. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Alex Jurgen. I'm a student in the joint degree program between the Kennedy School and Harvard Business School. Thank you both for coming. We're very honored to have you. Uh, my question goes off a point that Governor Huntsman raised, which was he talked about the opportunities and the possibility of China moving towards more of a consumption nation. 
Uh, one thing that we've been hearing reports on is rising labor costs in China, potentially shifting in manufacturing to other countries. My question is, how do these changing internal economic dynamics in China both affect Chinese sort of internal politics and also its relationship with the United States and the wider world? Well, the internal politics will be driven by the content of the five-year plan, which we're probably a year or two into, which focus on strategic industries that will help facilitate a transition away from an investment-led export model, which is dated, and they find themselves in a you know, middle-income trap. So they've got to uh, increase real wages, give people more opportunities by expanding commerce and, con and consumption. This isn't an easy thing to do, and there's no guaranteed outcome that they'll make it to the promised land. But so far as I can tell, they have departed port, and they're hedging or they're they're betting a lot of uh, a lot of their internal capital on making this transition complete. And there will be politics that will go with it, including dealing with, for example, uh, Chinese special interest politics, which is a new phenomenon, something I never saw in my early days in China. But today you have special interest politics. So if you let it grow naturally, I'd say 25 years from now, they'll look just like the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, have her bid. Uh, special <laughs> interest politics, you know, that, you know, put so much, exert so much pressure on the body politic that, you know, they, you know, they, they, they influence policymaking to, uh, to an overwhelming extent. So this whole transition, I think, will be a critically important part of how domestic politics will then respond to the economic performance over the next uh, few years. Uh, and they're doing it for all of the right and logical reasons. The math doesn't work. You know, you look at the social safety net issues that they're going to have to put in place. They're very expensive. You look at the actuarial studies on retirement over the next 10 and 20 years. Notwithstanding the fact they have $3 trillion in the central bank, they're falling well short of what they're going to need. So here's the trick domestically and why it becomes a difficult dom domestic political issue. You have to convince the average citizen that the time has come to withdraw from the mattresses, their run mean being invested into the long-term well-being of the country. Uh, that means you've got to have in place social safety net issues. You have to convince uh, through policy making that the road ahead looks predictable and won't be uh, sort of uh, won't be confronting revolution and in, 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 uh, and uh, outside intervention and the un unpredictable nature of what China has confronted the last 200 years. I just go back to the, the, you know, the Second Opium War you know, in the 1840s and then the Taiping Rebellion of the 1860s, you know, the Boxer Rebellion, fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1911, rise of the party in, you know, in 23, uh, invasion by Japan in 32, World War II, uh, 49, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, Tiananmen, you, know, you get the picture where most citizens need a little bit of comfort in looking ahead to make sure that the coast is clear. That's not easy to do, and that's the challenge that lies before the government. Externally, I think there is um, an outreach opportunity that China will have with much of the world, because they'll be consuming more. And that means uh, countries like the United States, which are we're good manufacturers. I think we have a chance to expand and get back on our feet from a manufacturing standpoint, as a matter of fact and to take advantage of what will be a growth opportunity based on exports in the China market. And that will likely have some impact on our longer term bilateral relationship. And Prime Minister, do you have a final word on the, the economy? Um, uh, it's big and it's growing. The, um, and there's going to be lots of opportunities uh, there for all of you guys and girls in this room, frankly. And my comment is, uh, given this our concluding remarks, is just a word of encouragement to all of you, frankly. Um, this is a, an extraordinarily dynamic time in global history um, and it will fall to your generation to negotiate much of it. Um, so those of you who have a passion for the world of business or the world of politics or the world of international relations, uh, my humble suggestion to each of you is um, get out there, get to know China, get to know the neighbours, get to know the languages. They're hard, they're difficult, but it's a sign of respect uh, when it comes to dealing with these very ancient continuing civilizations. And if you combine the great skills you're acquiring here at this extraordinary school, and one of the best universities in the world, 
uh, uh, with um, a knowledge and deep appreciation of this region, Asia, from the inside out, through its languages and cultures and civilizations, you're going to be world leaders. Do you know something? You're going to help preserve the peace and sustain prosperity on the way through. Well, this has been a terrific discussion here, and I just have one quick announcement that immediately after this event, students at the Forum Committee and the Harvard Political Union will be leading a post-forum discussion in room L166. So anyone is welcome to attend that, and if you're not sure you want to attend but you're hungry, they also have refreshments. So uh, <laughs> please uh, join me in thanking our distinguished guests here. Thank you. Thank you.